reform the police, defund the police, disband the police. Since the Memorial Day death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, you've begun to hear these demands more and more, both on the news and in the streets. But what do these demands really mean? And if any or all of them are met, how will it impact you and your community? Hi, I'm Christopher Nars, the community contributors and engagement editor at WHYY. Over the next four weeks, I will lead a series of conversations that explore the future of public safety in our region. On our first episode, I talked with grassroots civic leaders Megan Malachi of Philly for Real Justice, Therese McCleary of Moms Bonded by Grief, Jawan Bennett, assistant professor of criminal justice at Temple University, and Bilal Kwayum of the Father's Day Rally Committee. We talk about how to balance protesters' demands to defund the police with the desires of many residents for increased presence of law enforcement. Let's get started with Police Reimagined. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me for this important conversation. Megan, I'd like to start with you. You're an organizer with Philly for Real Justice, which is a part of a larger coalition called the Black Philly Radical Collective. And this collective recently released a set of demands, and among them is a demand entitled Fund Communities, Not Cops. Uh, this particular demand reads in part, we demand an immediate decrease in the Philadelphia Police Department's budget over five years until fully defunded. To translate, are you talking about starving the beast till its death? Or are you envisioning a city without cops? Yes, our goal is police abolition. We believe in a three-pronged pr plan, excuse me, that is focused through what we call disempower, disarm, and disband. And part of the disempowerment stage is definitely defunding the police and reinvesting in our community. What would you say to those who say that the, this proposition is not only radical, which you would agree, but that it's also reckless, that the city needs some form of law and order? How would you respond? I would ask the people who believe that to consider the fact that there are so many assumptions with that idea. There's the assumption that police are maintaining law and order. There's the assumption that the police are keeping us safe. And the reality is, is that police are not even solving murders and rapes in this city. So I think that we need to reimagine a different type of public safety at this point. Jawan, let me go to you. You're the criminologist here, and I want to get your take as a criminologist. But it's also no secret that your older brother, who you're very close with, is a Philadelphia police officer, and you yourself are a police chaplain. And so lots of officers, I'm sure, confide in you. Before I get you to react to uh, Megan and, and those demands, what are the officers saying to you in this moment, and particularly your brother? Uh, well, thank you, Chris. I think, first of all, I want to just echo the sentiments that I think uh, we have to uh, not impose our beliefs on the communities, but ask them like, how do they want to be policed? And I think it's really um, interesting from an officer's perspective, and even from a criminological standpoint, uh, a lot of officers, their uh, patrol jobs are not the cops and robbers, uh, so to speak. What you'll learn from police work is that most uh, police work is uh, what we call calls for service. And we know that 85% of most police work are that police are called to a uh, particular uh, situation. So I think when officers are uh, talking about the defund moment, which is really important that a lot of officers are saying, hey, maybe we should not, you know, be responding uh, to when one of your loved ones um, has, you know, um, a, a mental health crisis, or maybe we shouldn't be the ones to handle uh, domestic uh, disputes. And we talk about domestic disputes, not just violence, but over property. And one of the things I think when we talk about defunding the police, the devils are in the details. And I think uh, one, that, one of the interesting parts about it is that um, we have a whole litany of service. I don't think we have to create another entity. I think we need to expand. I think a leadership in the city has to expand the services that are expanded. So for example, uh, when somebody uh, dies of a homicide of a murder, police have to bag those bodies up and take them downtown, right? Why can't we spend tax dollars and um, increase the medical and examiner's unit? When police uh, have to go deal with mental health crisis, we have crisis intervention teams here in the city of Philadelphia. The problem is, and also like we think about police handling problems property disputes. We have a sheriff's office. Also, uh, when you think about police doing car stops for registration and insurance, we have a, a PPA. But the problem is the police force is the only 24-7 uh, entity that operates. So when individuals find themselves in crisis um, outside the hours of nine and five, there's no other organization to handle to police. So I think when we talk about to defund, it has, the devils have to be in the details. But I do agree from a community perspective that we should be placing those tax dollars if we don't spend them on police to expand the services that we already have in the city. I want to get to Therese and Bilal for a second, but let me just follow up with you again, Jawan, because Megan kind of uh, implied this in the beginning, that the, when 
just in this last week when I've had this conversation with people about defunding the police, their, their first initial reaction, and understandably so, at least in this moment, is what about the crime? This is an interesting time in Philadelphia to be talking about defunding the police. We have a homicide rate that's almost at 30 percent increase over 2019, and even 2019 was breaking records. From a criminology standpoint, is there a concern that if we even, let's not even talk about disbanding the police, let's just talk about defunding it for the moment. If we remove resources from the police department at a time where crime seems to be, or, or at least violent crime, is on the rise with homicides, are we putting ourselves in danger? I think that's interesting is also uh, a very tricky question. I I'll get to that in one second, but I will say this. We have a, a, a society that uh, thrives off what we call a social contract. It's a basic criminological concept that, you know, in the olden days, it was an eye for eye, two for two. So if you did something to me, Chris, that I can take out justice for myself. And so uh, starting in the 1700s, we came into this idea of a social contract that individuals would not uh, take it upon themselves uh, to find their own justice, but the state uh, would then come in place and take care of those matters. So I think because the way our society is set up, we'll always will need somebody to carry out that social contract. Now, to your to your question about having no police, uh, with, with that, you know, increase crime significantly. One of the things that is really interesting, um, and you can read it in any criminal justice textbook, you'll find out in any criminal justice class, um, the incarceration rate, right? So when the crime rate has stayed the same, incarceration rate has risen. When the crime rate has lowered, the incarceration rate has risen. When the crime rate has stayed the same, the incarceration rate has still risen. And so it begs the question, um, it's, it's really interesting when you think about ha having no police. And, and I will say what's interesting is about the police cannot be omnipresent, but the reason why we may not see um, police uh, solving more murders, police being uh, more active in the community, because we still have a war on drugs. And war on drugs uh, uh, pretty much designated that police would have to go in urban communities and that we would crack down um, on these social ills. And that's where all of the emphasis has been placed. And so, and throughout policing, we haven't, uh, there have been measures to have smart policing, proactive policing, evidence based policing, but it only can go but so far. Megan, I know you wanted to jump in, and then I'll go to Teresa Bilal. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, um, just to respond to the previous comments, I think that we could talk a lot about, you know, the crimin criminological perspective, but I think that what we're missing from this discussion is that the demands also include a very heavy critique of capitalism and white supremacy. So we're not going to talk about the origins of police and how they started in slave catching, how police have been weaponized against the working class, how police are still authorizing through their actions mass incarceration, I think that the discussion is not really where we need to be. Therese, when you hear, I mean, just, just your initial response to what you're hearing, and particularly imagining a city where there is no police infrastructure, but that the community members are handing, uh, handling those really difficult tasks, whether it's responding to mental health or, or otherwise, what, what do you say? If they can go back inside, revisit all of those hirees, all those police officers, make them reapply for their position, do an intense background as far as their mental health, their stability uh, mentally, and how many complaints they may have in their jacket. Um, I think that all should be revisited and then determine from there whether or not they should keep be able to keep their jobs. Um, I do think that some funding should be um, allocated into different departments um, as far as like maybe mental health. So you feel safer when you see police in your neighborhood? I feel safer with police that's doing their job. What do you say to the, the fact that the idea of policing, it, it's no longer opinion, it's a fact that the idea of policing did begin uh, as slave catchers. It is kind of rooted in this system of protecting property and, and, and protecting property over, over bodies. So even if you retrain police officers and you kind of give them this mental evaluation that you're speaking of, doesn't that, that system that Megan spoke of, or maybe it's a culture is a better word, that culture of, of white supremacy, that culture of, of capitalism, that culture of hate, doesn't that still exist even if you kind of re-interview the officers? Oh, uh, it's gonna always exist, Chris. How, how can we get rid of it? I mean, honestly, but, um... It's going to always be here. You know, I just don't agree with totally dismantling the police department. I don't. Bilal, let me bring you into the conversation. Let me get your reaction. Chris, what's bringing us to this conversation today is basically what's going on in America and what's been going on in America for years. Um, and that is white institutional racism. I look at the police department, the army, as the arm of white institutional racism to keep it going in America. So 
uh, I really believe, really believe strongly in that. And I also be, believe very strongly that uh, white institutional racism has to be dismantled by white folks. They created it, they maintain it, they have to destroy it. So to say all of that, um, we have to deal with racism every day as black folks and people of color in this country. Um, I do believe strongly that we do. But if you're saying that, I believe, I really believe that we do need a police force. Now, I think that um, we have to restructure the police force. And we also have to make sure, like the, the sister just said a few minutes ago, we get rid of the, the folks who are not um, protecting us and serving us, and they should be. Um, but we need, I believe, as uh, all conversations you and me had, I really believe we have to have a police force. And I'll use one example. Um, the sister said earlier, and I, I, I'm, I have to disagree with you that the police are doing work. Yesterday, a good friend of mine, um, a son who was killed two years ago, they arrested the young man that killed his son. Also, that young man had um, three other murders. So today, he's arrested in jail for killing four black folks. And this is a young black man. Um, so the police did do their work over the last two years. Really, to be honest with you, dug deep did the investigation, was able to bring this person um, to arrest, and now he's in jail. But, but Bilal, let me, let me just push back, let me just push back there, Bilal. The, the, the Philadelphia Inquirer just today released an editorial, and I'll read part of it. Uh, it says, in 2020 through May 27th, an arrest followed only 20% of non-fatal shooting incidents and 35% of homicides. Only nine of the 29 homicides and 20 of the 115 non-fatal shootings in April were cleared. A Washington Post investigation to the homicide clearance rate found that most arrests are made within 10 days following the incident with the likelihood of solving it going down with every day passing. They go on to write, well into, well into June, it is likely that many of the homicides and non-fatal shootings will go unsolved forever. And this is the key part of the, uh, the inquiry's editorial. They say, quote, if a well-resourced, less burdened police department was able to prevent gun violence and solve shootings, Philadelphia could have proven that in April. It didn't. So you, you could point out one, one case where the police is solved, but if you look at overall, the police are not solving the crimes and they're also not stopping the crime. So well, how would you well, answer that? Well, Chris, well, Chris number one, they are solving some crimes. That's, I mean, we got to be honest about that, all right? Um, number two, uh, there is, it's like this is very complex and even complex with me. And I would say this and sound like I'm contradicting myself. I wrote an article, op-ed, in 2007. Um, basically, my op-ed was, as I did analysis, um, since the 60s. Uh, the more police we had on the street, um, didn't mean that we would have less crime. And in years where we had less police on the street, we did have less crime. So there, there's this contradiction back and forth about should we have more police or less police. But the issue to me about abandoning police uh, is a um, much more complex discussion. Now use that one example because I know other friends of mine who have lost children to crime and, and they found the the person who shot them. Now, a lot of them have it, like you said. So I do know, as I speak now, we, we're on this, there is those families are now organizing to put pressure on the police to, to break this cycle of um, not having enough solved homicides. Last point I want to make on this is- Okay, Megan, again, it go ahead, I'm sorry. Back to the point I made earlier about institutional racism. A lot of these police officers that in the homicide unit don't give a good damn about black folks. I can tell you that, all right? So we have to change, like you said earlier, the culture. That's what I think we gotta work on, is how do we change the culture of policing in America, and particularly in Philadelphia? Okay, but I'll, Megan, I'm gonna come back to you one second, but I wanna let Jawan respond to everything he's heard. Go yeah, ahead, and I, just given the comments, and I, and I, I, I would agree with Megan and, B and Bilal, and I think that uh, we do have uh, structural racism that, that's put in place, and I think we need to think about a major overhaul uh, when we think about um, policing. And the only reason why I bring up the criminological landscape is to provide context. And one thing I want to be uh, fundamentally clear is um, I do believe that we should defund, but again, the devil, uh, the details, uh, the devil is in the details. Um, 
I, I have me and a bunch of my colleagues, we, we are, we call ourselves prison abolitionists. We believe in that movement. And one of the things we have to be very careful about the un, un, um, unintended consequences of what we call for. And I'll give two really um, germane examples um, and I'll open it back to the floor. One was um, a lot of scholars, even myself, we called to the end of the death penalty. We said it was inhumane, human rights, um, watch international, Amnesty International, we called for it. And what happened was we saw that the death penalty uh, pretty much was or is not really as used as much primarily in states. But then what happened was um, life without parole since and skyrocketed. One of the uh, uh, consequences of that was that when you do ha uh, are sentenced to death row, there are more privileges and protections for you to appeal your case if you're innocent. Once you have a life without parole sentence, meaning that you'll pretty much die by incarceration, you'll die in prison, there's a, a less of a uh, less of a standard for your, your innocence, and it's really hard to fight that crime. Another example is uh, I do a lot of research. I'm uh, finishing dissertation now uh, uh, with uh, juvenile lifers, and a lot of advocacy organizations has called, um, especially during the pandemic uh, to let people uh, get out of prison. We've been focusing a lot on prisoner reentry, and one of the un unintended consequences of that has been because we have focused so much on prisoner reentry, we have forgot about the incarceration experience in general, and that people have to live in very inhumane uh, conditions. So people, especially the public, is like, oh wow, it's great that people are getting out of prison, but we haven't focused on the damaging effects that happen in incarceration. So I would warn individuals, yes, we should defund, but we also should get into the weeds of what that looks like and get into the details because there could be some potential unintended consequences. Well, let's get into the details. Megan, what do you see as the unintended consequences of disbanding the Philadelphia Police Department over five years? In terms of unintended consequences, you know, I think that we might need to reframe the way we're talking about this. Like a lot of the discussion is about, you know, oh my God, like what will happen if the police are disbanded? There won't be any law and order. There won't be that many protections. But again, like I said previously, like I really want to challenge this idea that we have protections right now. You know, Brother Bilal mentioned the case of one family. And of course, like I am just like every other black person, extremely concerned about gun violence, complete, con extremely concerned about other forms of violence we're experiencing in our community. But I don't think the fear of gun violence, the fear of drugs can stop us from the reality that the police are not keeping us safe. And so when I think we start getting into the discussions about unintended consequences, we're continuing the same white supremacist narrative that we need the police. And so I think the better question that we can ask is what are we going to do to stop these so-called horrible things that we believe are going to happen? So if we're worried about things like gun violence, why are we not talking to our city officials about the roots of gun violence? A lot of the roots of gun violence aren't because Black people are inherently violent, it's because Black people don't have any jobs. There's no economic resource to deal with a lot of these young men and women in the city. So why are we not discussing that in this panel? So I'll stop there for now. Can I follow up, Chris? Well, well I okay. just want to follow up and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go to Therese and then Joanne, but I want to just follow up with you, Megan. Do you understand, and I take your point and I think it's right, but do you understand why most people's reaction to this new idea, I mean, for you guys in the coalition, and I, I first learned of you guys in 2014 after Brandon Tate Brown, you guys have been talking about police abolitionists uh, and, and abolishing the police for at least four or five years. And it would seem that the rest of the country is just starting to catch up. But so you can understand why the majority of the public, this is a new idea, and their first reaction is, well, what's going to happen? Because that's all, the, the only system they know is we have this police. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, we understand totally that that is going to be the reaction. But we also understand that we want to push our communities to deal with the reality, once again, that police aren't keeping us safe. And I'd also like to mention the recent Supreme Court decision where the justices stated that the police have no obligation to keep you safe. So to me, that expands this discussion even more. If the highest court in the land are saying, you know what, the police don't have any obligation to keep you safe, then what are we really talking about? And so instead of, you know, discussing... Well, let me ask you this, uh, Megan. I'd like you... Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't... Uh, no, I'm... Oh, okay. Please, so, please continue. So I was, what I was going to say was, was instead of discussing unintended consequences, I'd like to have better discussions about how we can significantly reduce within the next six months to a year the police presence in our community. Oh, I think someone else mentioned in the panel, you know, talking about issues of mental illness. Like, I want to have discussions about what people in our community have the skills to deal with mental illness that we can bring in 
to deal with our community members who are experiencing mental illness episodes. If we have an issue with homelessness in our community, what so social service folks can we bring in to address those issues? If we have issues of domestic violence, you know, what type of counselors and violence de escalators can we bring in to deal with those issues? And I also like to point out that the last time I read statistics, three out of four police officers had been involved in some type of domestic violence incident. So if that's the case, if those are the people we are saying are going to protect us, I really once again think that we need to rethink and reimagine what we're asking from the police because from what we can tell, they're so simply not equipped to do what we're asking them to do. Therese, I'd like you to respond to that. What, what, you know, what would make you feel safe? When you say you feel safe with more police presence, why do you say that? Um, there's so much violence going on out here, Chris. Um, and I just feel as though if we totally dismantle the police department and there's times when um, there's a group of guys standing on the corner and we know that out of 20 of them, um, 10 of them may have firearms on them. And we have to call the police because we know something is about to happen and we no longer have a, a police force to call who will address that issue for us you know so in some cases they well let me ask that let me ask that question to megan let me ask that question who like because that's a good example that's a that's a legitimate fear that you have megan let's take that example if we defund the police over the next five years how would we address that type of concern well if we're talking about a time period of five years i think that gives us the opportunity to again train people who are experts at de-escalation. And I think we can also train people who have the ability to deal with the existence of guns. And you know, I think once again, there's the underlining assumption that when the police come and deal with the brothers on the corner who have the guns, that they're one, taking the guns, that is often not the case. And two, that they're gonna stop those people from coming back. And I think that if we have people addressing this who are actually from that community, invested in the community, they'd be there during these moments where these violent incidents are happening, rather than calling the police who are not from the community, don't know the people in the neighborhood, and have no history in talking to them about these issues. Jawan, I'd like you to respond to them below. Sure. I, you know, I, I want to just uh, follow up on a couple of points. When I talk about the unintended consequences, I'm not really talking about addressing the lawlessness, lawlessness and the fear. I want to be uh, very clear about it. So I, you mentioned our work with the police uh, ch chaplains and, and, and work with police. What, happen, what happens is now because a lot of our city tax dollars are designated to police, um, they then came almost like the para community organization. So uh, if you look at things like the POW program, uh, also the Philadelphia Police uh, Department, they run something called the Cheers program, uh, where it runs through uh, the spring months and they take kids uh, every Saturday and they uh, uh, have a lot of interactive activities. Also, um, a lot of the police uh, advisory commissions and the PDEX, they get together. I mean, I was a part, I mean, you can look on the news, every Christmas lines uh, wrapped around the precinct, giving away to toys and food. And so when I talk about the un unintended consequences, this is what I'm talking about. When, and this, we need to be careful about the details. When we do defund the police and that money is not allocated to police department. Can we trust in our city leadership to make sure the money gets where it's supposed to be? For prime example, understanding consequences, we had an office of black male engagement that was uh, supposed to address uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, high school dropout education inequities. Uh, we're supposed to address some of the homicides and, 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 and murder in the city, some of the disproportional outcomes that affects black men. I think you did an article, Chris, and you could explain, well, there wasn't a lot of outcomes that came out of this. And, and for instance, there, before uh, we had a defund movement, we can look at this uh, city council's budget. They had, they had cut education programs. They had cut monies that were designated part. So when we did defund police, what what mo what money are we going to put in programs to ensure that the de-escalation and that our communities are going to be safe? So we have to be very specific. Bilal, respond to everything you've heard. Yeah. One, um, the point with this may add a, add a laugh because she's right. Um, we could, def we, let's say that the Mar City Council, next phase of City Council, that we're not funding the police department. That, and everybody said that money should be reverted to other activities. There's no guarantee that there will be. Um, would it be a certain amount go to housing, a certain amount go to mental health stuff? So that's a whole nother discussion in itself when we talk about the funding, the police, and where the money would go to. I think that I like to say, Chris, is uh, the sister who unfortunately had lost a child to violence, um, 
that's the bottom line is how do we, and someone mentioned it earlier, how do we really as a black community now develop a healing campaign in our community to change the mindset of young males who might get involved um, and using gunplay? That's, that's the struggle we have. And I mentioned it in my comment, open comments, institutional white racism is clear, is, has created this whole climate we're living in. So until that's been challenged and destroyed, um, the, our other alternative as a people is to build our own communities, protect our own communities. And, and maybe the sister's right, because I was thinking, you know, I'm always open, as you know, Chris. Uh, I'm not the person that gets locked into one idea and I just stay there. And sometimes I do. But she raised a good point about a five-year process. So we need to have this five-year conversation, I believe, where we as Black people are going to go and, and, and what kind of systems we have to put in place to protect us. Um, right now, I, I'm not, I know we're not there about cutting out police. Um, what we have to fight, though, let me say, with the police department is making the changes that are needed to be changed. Council um, Thursday, yesterday, introduced a resolution, and they are, um, there's going to be a ballot question in November for citizens in this city to vote on a permanent police um, oversight commission with chief and power to control, I'm going to use that word, kind of control the police. We need to be supporting it. That's a change. That's a change we could do now. Council also um, um, introduced yesterday, and I know it's going to be passed, they're going to have that police officers have to live in Philadelphia. What we also have to talk about, uh, Chris, quickly is getting more black police officers on the fourth. Why we're having a lot of attention now, in particular in Philadelphia, is we have the police forces really turning white. In the next couple of years, the way we're moving, 80% or more of the police officers in the city of Philadelphia that will be throwing our streets are going to be police officers, white police officers that don't live in Philly. So changing the residency requirement, I think, can help, but we got to get more black uh, males and females to step up and become police officers because that way we really become been patrolling and, and, and ourselves and looking out for ourselves. Megan, Bilal, Therese, Juwan, thank you so much for joining me for this important conversation. Your contributions were invaluable. And we're going to keep the conversation going. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks for watching Police Reimagined. We're going to keep the conversation going, so we'd like to hear your thoughts. Email them to talkback at whoy.org. There's more to say on this series. We'll be back next week at the same time. For WHLY, I'm Chris Norris. Good night.